welcome to the first video on energy and for today we're looking at energy conversions and types of energy. Learning intentions for today's lesson is that energy has a number of different forms. The unit for energy is the joule with a capital J for the unit and energy can be transferred from one type of energy to another type of energy. So let's start off with the question of what is energy? Energy is the thing needed to create a change in something's motion. So for example, if an object is moved, as in we speed it up, we slow it down, its direction is changed, any of those things, we need energy for that to happen. It can't just happen on its own. And you might be like, oh, well, I can push something. I can push it to speed it up. I can push it to change direction. But that means that you are actually using energy on it. So energy is still required. What are the types of energy? Some of the key ones that we start off with is chemical energy. Chemical is usually stored in a medium and it's released later into different forms. So it's in the bonds of the things in the chemical um It's in the bonds of the chemicals. Some examples of this could be the food we eat is then stored in our body until our body breaks it down and, and splits it apart to get that energy. It can be stored in batteries, which is a chemical form of energy. And petrol that we use in our cars and fossil fuels are another type of chemical energy waiting to be consumed to release. Another type is elastic potential energy. So this is a, a different type of potential energy that we'll see shortly. And it's really energy that's stored in elastic materials as a result of stretching and compressing. So that red section is the key part that you need to understand. Examples of this include things like a jack-in-a-box, a rubber band, stretching a catapult, things like that. The next type of energy we're looking at is, believe it or not, it's electrical energy. So it's all about um, charges. Electrical energy is all to do with the movement of charged particles. And in electricity, those charged particles are electrons that are moving. So it was an example of, ele of electrical energy that originates in nature. Where would we find it ordinarily? We don't go wandering around the bush and find a light bulb. But what would we see in the real world in nature that is related to electrical energy? The answer is lightning. We would see lightning, static charge, when you scuff your feet along the carpet and you zap someone, that happens all the time. Next type of energy that we're looking at. It's kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is all about moving things. Everything that is moving has kinetic energy. The faster it moves, the more energy it has. There's another factor that we'll talk about in more detail later, but it's also to do with how massive the object is. How much mass it has affects how much energy it has. What's an example of motion energy in nature? So think of something that has energy in nature that is moving. I'm interested to know what you come up with for this one. Next one we're looking at is electromagnetic energy. So the x-ray example is one form, but there is a whole range of them. So Electromagnetic energy is energy that travels by waves or particles. So here we have what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. So all of the different types of waves that fit on that spectrum. We're familiar with TV. We got our FM and AM bands of TV. We've got infrared light, which is a type of electromagnetic energy. Ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays. We can go even higher to things like cosmic rays. So from the diagram, what are some other types of electromagnetic energy that you are familiar with that we haven't covered yet, perhaps? Where does sunlight fall under in the UV spectrum? Where would I find it if I was to try and classify it? Sunlight is actually a combination of things. So visible light, we can certainly see sunlight. It is primarily ultraviolet in this band here because a lot of sunlight is made up of ultraviolet light. The next type of energy we're looking at is thermal energy, often called heat energy. Heat is contained within an object and it's transferred between objects resulting in temperature. So heat and temperature are definitely related, but it's often misunderstood what people mean when they say heat. Heat is not technically temperature. Temperature is like degrees Celsius, but heat is a type of energy, which is measured in joules. So next time someone says to you, what's the heat of this room? And you go, it's 600 joules. 
and they look at you like you're an insane person, you'd be like, well, you asked me what the heat was, not what the temperature was. So you are actually correct. They've asked you the wrong question. Temperature is a measure of kinetic energy of the particles. So the little atoms zipping around, how fast they're moving is how much kinetic energy they have. That's actually what we're measuring when we say the temperature of a room is 10 degrees Celsius. Heat, however, is the energy of the particle itself. How much energy can be transferred from one to another? Generally, heat is the measure of energy and kinetic energy is the measure of temperature. So you can see, as we crank the Bunsen burner, the more energy is given to the thing, the temperature starts to rise, but also you'll notice that the particles start to move faster, which is important. We'll talk about this a little bit later when we do particle theory as well. You guessed it, sound energy is the next type of energy that we're looking at. So this is the energy due to the vibration of air particles, causing the air around the objects to produce a sound, which eventually reaches our ears. Think of it like a game of pass the information. If you lined up in a line next to someone and they whisper something in your ear, kind of like Chinese whispers, but you're trying to do it as quick as possible, and then eventually the person on the other end gets exactly what the first message was. That's how sound is working. So you play a speaker, the speaker vibrates the air around it, that air then bangs into air next to it, which bangs into air next to it, and it repeats that process all the way to your ear. Your eardrum then vibrates. It's got a very, very sensitive little vibrating part in the eardrum, and your brain can then convert those vibrations into actual information, words, sound, etc. So that is sound energy. Can you hear sound in space? If you said yes, you would be wrong. You cannot hear sound in space. The reason for it is because the definition here is that it's causing air particles or just particles, because we can have sound in solids, to vibrate. There is nothing in space to vibrate, so sound cannot travel. So no one can hear you scream in space. The next thing we're looking at is gravitational potential energy. So this is another form of potential energy, generally the more common form. But potential energy is energy that's stored in an object as a result of its position from the ground due to the attractive force by Earth. Whew, that is a mouthful. A simpler way to think of it is anything that is lifted or suspended or higher off the ground has gravitational potential. The higher it is, the more energy it possesses. The reason because of that is because we have a gravitational field. We have gravity on Earth. If you had no gravity, you would have no gravitational potential. But we do. Pretty much every planet has some form of gravity. So therefore, as it's lifted higher and higher from the surface, it gains potential energy. Which point on this roller coaster, A, B, C, or D, would have the highest gravitational potential when you were at that point? Hopefully you said C, and you would be correct. It is because C is the highest point from the ground, Therefore, you would have the highest amount of potential energy here. We'll talk about this in more detail in a later lesson, and I'll give you the equation to actually calculate how much energy you would have. What I want you to do now is have a look at Office has disabled my add-ins. There is a FET simulator called Energy Skate Park. If you just search FET, P-H-E-T, Energy Skate Park, you'll find it. And what I want you to do is just have a little bit of a play around at first, just to figure out how it works. There's a bit of an intro. Um, the playground is probably what we'll mainly deal with because it involves actually building a track. But you're going to build a bit of a track for the skateboarder. You put them on it and they start rolling around. What is quite cool though, is that you can turn on your graph and you can see the kinetic and potential changing. So when I get to this bottom point, you can see she's not moving, so she has no kinetic. She still has some potential, but that's because she's on the, off the ground. Now that she's off the ground, no potential, no kinetic. If I put her way up here, she's got lots of potential. When she starts rolling, she's got heaps of kinetic, not much potential because she's close to the ground. Now switch over. So what I want you to do is experiment with this simulator a little bit. I want you to construct a track that allows a loop for loop, and then look at the change in potential and kinetic energy throughout your path. 
These questions will be answered in your science notes document on Google Classroom, but I want you to tell me at what point is the potential energy zero? At what point is the kinetic energy zero? Where would the kinetic and the potential be equal to each other? Can you create an endless loop that never stops and explain it? Can you make a second hill that is higher than the first and you still get over it? So if we go back to my simulator really quick, what I mean is can you find a way so that I can get to the top of that hill and get over the top of it? So far I haven't been able to do it, but there's got to be a way, right? Like if I just make it steeper or something like that, maybe there's a way to do it. That's the challenge for you. Can you make a point where they get higher than they started with? So answer these in your science notes document. So why did I show you this video? It's all to do with energy conversions. So we've said before that we've got all these different types of energy. Energy can be converted from one thing to another. And in the video that you might have just been able to see, which is really emphasized in this photo here, the brake rotors of those cars were glowing red hot as they came in. Where does that heat come from? Why are they glowing red? The heat has come from, yes, you might say friction, sure, but that's not an energy source or an energy type. We didn't talk about friction. It's coming from the kinetic energy. You're converting that kinetic energy into heat in order to slow down the vehicle. That's how the brakes are working. So another example of uh, energy conversions is if I have solar energy from the sun, it's then converted to chemical energy in food, which is a form of potential. And that's through your photosynthesis process. The plants absorb it, they create an energy source. And then you eat the food and you use that for kinetic energy during sport. Another example could be kinetic energy from the wind. That then turns our turbine blades, which create electrical energy, which then is stored in chemical energy in your charging device. So like your portable battery or your phone itself is a form of battery. And then you use that to produce sound while you're cranking your beats on Spotify. So that's another form of energy conversions. A parting thought for you. This is something that I got off Reddit. It's particularly interesting. It's talking about energy conversions. Someone has asked the question of, how hard would I have to slap a chicken to cook it? If we know that we can convert energy from one thing to another, the kinetic energy of my hand would convert to heat energy, which would be able to cook a chicken if my hand was moving fast enough. So what they've actually done is these calculations will make a lot more sense later on. But they've used, this is real world physics calculations, they've made a few approximations. Your hand weighs 400 grams. The average slap is 11 meters per second. The average chicken weighs a kilo. It needs to be at 205 degrees to cook it. So they've said the average slap would increase the temperature by 0 0.0089 degrees Celsius. So for an ordinary slap, you'd have to slap it 23,034 times for it to cook. Not to mention this would have to be very, very quick slaps so it doesn't cool down. However, if you wanted to cook it in a single slap, you would have to slap it with a speed of 1,665 meters per second. And it would cook. However, you would probably obliterate the chicken and then you'd just be breathing chicken cooked dust from throughout the room but it is possible. Science. Time for a good old success criteria check. Ask yourself, can I clearly explain the different forms of energy? Can I explain the unit of energy and its symbol? Can I explain what is meant by an energy transfer and give an example? If the answer is yes, well done, you have achieved the learning intention for this lesson. Move on to the next lesson. If the answer is no, Check with your partner, come and speak to me. Let's clarify that before we move on. I'll see you next lesson. Tell me pretty lies, look me in the face, tell me that you love me, even if it's fake.